Okay, so lecture one and video one of uh, semester two, food supply chain, which will be broken into two parts. Okay, that's what we'll be talking about. We'll start a little bit by thinking about where your food comes from. Um, four crops refer to the issue that a lot of our food comes from a relatively small number of crops. And we'll talk about the food supply chain and expand on that in the second part of this lecture and probably later in the module as well. Uh, so where does your food come from? Um, here's some questions for you to think about. Think about your favourite meal or a meal you eat regularly. Where did you buy the food? That's probably fairly straightforward. A supermarket, maybe a local shop, maybe online. Uh, what are the ingredients? Where did the ingredients come from? So there's a number of examples here. So the chips, uh, potatoes, obviously may have been grown locally. We, we do import quite a lot of potatoes as well. The second meal, lots of veggies and eggs and what looks like a, a, a sort of a rice, which may have come from quite a few different parts uh, of the world. Uh, the famous Greg's Vegan Sausage Roll, the filling was made locally um, by corn and, and further manufactured by Greg's up in their plants on, in, in, in near Townside. Uh, the, the pastry and the sausage roll, the ingredients that may have come from further afield. Um, so have a think about what the ingredients are, where they came from, and how they got from where they were grown initially to your plate. Okay, UK food imports. Um, this is based on the farm gate value of unprocessed food in 2019, during which the UK supplied just over 55% of the food we actually consume. The leading foreign, as we must call them now, supplier of food consumed in the UK were countries from the European Union, as you might expect. Africa, Asia, North and South America, each country, but about 4% of the food consumed in the UK. And if you look at the commodities, the three largest value imported commodity groups at 2019 prices are fruit and vegetables, meat and beverages. Now these are taken from the uh, Food Statistics Pocket Book, which more in a moment. Uh, there's another example of some information from the Food Statistics Pocket Book. Uh, it used to be available as a PDF, which is quite useful at quickly finding information. Sadly, that's not the case anymore. But the web version does contain lots of useful information. Um, so we can see from this uh, information here, for example, 120 billion agri-food sector. And when you look down at consume, UK consumer um, con expenditure, 234 billion on food, drink and catering during 2019, which is the last year we have figures for. Uh, so quite a lot. It'd be interesting to see how the ratio between eating at home and, and, and catering changes. Obviously, very few people have been eating, eating outside over the past year, uh, but more people have been buying, buying food from online, for example. So it'd be interesting to see how things have changed. Okay, four crops that feed the world. Um, Global agriculture is increasingly dominated by just a handful of crops with limited genetic richness. Um, despite an increase in the diversity of crops grown across the planet over the last 60 years, the largest share of our crops worldwide is now made up of just a few types of plants. Four of these particularly dominant crops, wheat, wheat, beg your pardon, <laughs> wheat, maize, soy and rice, now take up about 50% of the farmland on earth. Um, see this paper? For an in-depth review of the changes, uh, the Anthropocene referred to there, you've probably heard of, it's a proposed geological epoch dating from the commencement of significant human impact in the Earth's geology and ecosystems. Here, the anth Anthropocene epoch is partially defined by the anthrop anthropogenic spread of crops beyond their centres of origin. Um, well worth having a read, there's lots of, lots of interesting stuff in that paper. Um, okay, so... So this is taken from that paper. These graphs show changes in crop diversity over the past 60 years. And it's interesting to note after a peak in diversity in the 1980s, we've seen a steadily decline since. So have a think about you. Why is this a potentially serious issue? Um, the lectures in this semester, in this module and in other modules, are mostly provided for you to get background information and the online sessions are mostly devoted to discussions which we will expect you to lead. So have a think about why this matters. Uh, later in the module we'll look at alternative crops and new ways of growing them. 
Uh, here's one way of looking at it. It's underutilised crops, which are defined as those with unrealised potential to contribute to human welfare, in particular for income generation for the world's power, food security and nutrition. Reduction of hidden hunger, that is, hunger issues caused by micronutrient deficiency resulting from over-uniform diets. Again, we'll talk about that when I do my micronutrients lecture in another module. Um, this web page here uh, has some good information, but seems to have stalled over the past year. Um, for more up-to-date information, see the Science Direct page. Um, when you do a search for this sort of thing, you often come up with Science Direct's compendium of recent papers, which is well worth having a look at. Uh, they have some papers which may be a little bit esoteric, but they often have papers which go through a general introduction to the issue, so well worth having a look at the resources there. And this an example here, the Bambura groundnut. Um, it's indigenous to sub-Saharan Africa, where it's widely cultivated. So see the uh, FAO link there in the image uh, for a recipe. <laughs> And also see the video here on the Memora bomb being uh, for another example. Okay, the food supply chain. Um, that's a straightforward definition. The reality is often very complicated, especially for long distance food chains. Um, but that's where we're starting from, that's our starting point. Uh, these diagrams also show a fairly straightforward view of the process which is actually somewhat idealised, but it's a good way of starting to develop our understanding. Uh, particularly the linking of recycling and recovery back into food production, how much of that actually takes place. Um, later we'll look at a very good student food project and using food waste to grow algae as an animal food stock, which sort of is one way of potentially, potentially closing this chain. Then uh, here's another image showing a typical way of presenting the overall issues around the food supply chain but as we'll discover it it is a simplification but it's always a good idea to start off with what, what i call a helicopter view uh, which helps you get a general understanding and then allows you to drill down into the details uh, recyclable packaging so a little digression here um, historically the classical example of recyclable packaging in the uk was a milk bottle Practically every household will have its milk, milk delivered in bottles, which will be later collected for reuse. Recent attempts to revive this practice have been quite small scale, uh, but some people are trying to do this. Uh, one issue with when, when it was done ubiquitously was that birds evolved to take advantage of the source of rich nutrient that the cream that separated on the top of the milk provided. Uh, this was first reported in 1921 and first scientifically described in 1949. So there's uh, links. There is, there's, there's links in the notes and there's a link to a BBC uh, article there as well. Uh, yeah, and links to some, some Science Direct topics, uh, which are also, as I say, in the notes. Uh, as well as customs have been deprived of the cream, unfortunately the birds often carried food poisoning organisms. Um, practically the answer to this was to leave egg cups for the milkman. Uh, it was usually a, a milkman in those days, which they would put over the top of the new bowls. Assuming your milk man was in a good mood. Okay, so again on recyclable packaging, this article here um, lists a number of potential ways for recycling packaging, including in score, food service, and at home, all areas in which we need to think about in the future. As another example here, uh, looking at McDonald's coffee coffee beans. Uh, every year, McDonald's produces more than 62 million pounds of coffee chaff. You can work that out in, in kilograms yourself. Uh, chaff is unused dried skin that comes off coffee beans during the roasting process. In the past that went straight into landfills, uh, but now it seems that the Ford Motor Company is taking that chaff and turning it into car parks, which, car parts, which is which is interesting. Okay, I, I mentioned early on that supply chains are complicated, and here's a schematic of the food supply chain taken from a moderately recent paper. Uh, shows a connection between the three main sectors, the agricultural sector, the food processing industry, and the distribution sectors, both wholesale and retail. Uh, the report notes that since specific food supply chains exist for every food, single food supply item produced, purchased by consumers, the following, following description is a necessary simplification. That is always the case. There may be ways which we'll talk about 
of managing this better at the moment is a very difficult area but again there's links there i think it's in the notes there's links to a paper if you're interested in reading more on this yeah this diagram <laughs> catches some of the complexity uh, click on the link then move on uh, have a look at the video um, many possible versions of such analyses can be found in the literature so for more background have a read of the have a watch of the video and it's I mean, that's the sort of when you look at the diagram and I'll, I'll probably post this in the notes as well it's a very pretty diagram i'm not totally convinced about how helpful that sort of thing is but it is a way of demonstrating if nothing else just how complicated the food supply chain is okay uh, so here's another paper which is worth having a read because i think it, it helps clarify some of the key areas associated with the food supply chain so smith identified four types of food supply chain local conserved manufacturing and commodity and the links there as usual um, so here are examples of the food supply chain identified so conserved some of these are fairly straightforward you can, you can figure out what they are yourself but conserved refers to preserved foods which include very traditional methods such as pickling and smoking but also canning pasteurization and freezing and more recent technologies such as chilling aseptic and controlled atmosphere packaging commodity foods are those traded in large volumes of the world often even before they are grown so if you click on the image it'll take you to the uh, fao's well, well it's linked in the link of the notes anyway the fao's the food agriculture organization's list of food commodities which is well worth having a look at if you're interested um, and i've done an interactive vis visualization here based on smith's paper so you can go through and look at the different types um, the different types of commodity and the food miles and the market sizes and the seasonality and all these we, we might actually look at this in the in the semester um, but it's there if you want to have a look at it before and yeah i know uh, the word food scarf used to be a largely technical definition related to places and spaces where people acquired food prepare food talk about food or generally gather some sort of meaning from food uh, Sai, this has recently been turned overtaken by images of landscapes made out of food uh, but there is a, a link there to some general general topics and uh, in the in the what, in the good definition of foodscape, which is not to say the landscape made out of food aren't pretty. Uh, it's just a, a, it would be nice if they found a different word for them. Okay, that's all for the first lecture. I'll be back in a little while with the second part. Thanks for listening.